Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining today's session. My name is Irina, and I'm the event planner for the Redmond Reactor Space. Before we get started, I have a few things to go over. One second. Please take a moment to read our code of conduct. We seek to provide a respectful environment for both our audience as well as our presenter. We encourage engagement in the chat, but please be mindful of your commentary, remain professional, and on topic. Useful links will also be shared in the chat. This session is recorded and will be available on demand in 24 to 48 hours on the Microsoft Reactor YouTube channel. Which brings us to today's session. The session will run approximately one hour with questions throughout, and I'll now turn it over to our speaker for introductions. Awesome. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. Welcome. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening. Hello, wherever you are in the world. Welcome to episode two of our digital agriculture series. So this is all about taking IT for beginners, our uh, IT curriculum. We're working through the second project on that, focusing on digital agriculture. We kicked this off last week. Uh, with soil moisture sensing, and today we're looking at automated watering. Now, we will be using a mixture of electricity and water today, so if you're going to be doing this at home at any point, please be careful, and if I suddenly start shaking and then everything goes black, I probably electrocuted myself, so we're going to, fingers crossed, that that doesn't happen. Um, so, welcome, welcome to the stream. If you've not come across me before, I'm Jim Bennett. I'm all over the internet at Jim Bob Bennett. Uh, I tweet, post, write code, all about the internet of things and other cool technologies. So please, please get in touch. So all over the internet at Jim Bob Bennett, feel free to connect. And any questions you've got from today's session, please just reach out. I'm here to help. So as I said, today we are focusing on IoT for Beginners Project 2 and the second lesson in that project. Now, so this is the second lesson. So if you joined me last week for the first lesson, uh, feel free to say hi. We have the chat is open. I'd love your questions. You can anytime during the session, you can ask questions, make comments. I'm here to come talk to you as well as talk at you. So please, please, please engage in the chat. Uh, but if you were if you were here last week, can you give me like a thumbs up in the chat? Um, and if you weren't, give me a thumbs down and then maybe let me know where in the world you are. Turned out last week we had some folks from Scandinavia, uh, from India, and across northern, northern and southern America. Uh, but if you're, but wherever you're in the world, please let me know and let me know whether you joined us last week. Now, if you haven't come across IoT for Beginners before, it is our free open source 24 lesson IoT curriculum designed to teach you IoT from the basics, going all the way through to some semi advanced kind of use cases. Oh, we have Huskinar from Germany. Welcome, Huskinar. Love that avatar. That's so cool. So welcome, welcome. And Krillmanel is back. Hey, hey, Jim, still here from Sweden. Lots of thumbs up. Awesome. Great to have you back again. Uh, thank you for joining us last week. Great to have you here again this week. So cool. Yay. Familiar faces. Love it. Um, so IoT for Beginners is available at aka.ms slash IoT dash beginners. Follow that link. Uh, which has just been dropped in the chat, uh, and it will take you to this. It's all on GitHub, and I say it is free, it is MIT licensed, it's open source, and we have 24 lessons that teach you all about the Internet of Things. We start with just a basic project that introduces the concepts of the hardware and the software, and you build a nightlight that's controlled over the Internet. We then move on a journey from farm to table. So we do digital agriculture, you know, where your food comes from. We look at logistics, how you get your food to uh, a processing plant or distribution plant. We look at um, manufacturing and processing, where we use AI to do food, food quality detection. We look at retail, again, using AI to stock shelves. And then we look at consumer IoT. You build a smart timer. Same as when you go, you know, Alexa, sort of two minute timer when you're cooking. And so that's all the projects here. Everything's completely hands on. We introduce the concepts and then give you something to build. So through each project here, you actually build something. Um, and you can build this either using hardware or hardware simulators. Um, Gure says, hi. Hello. Welcome. Welcome. Glad to have you. Glad to have you with us. Where, where in the world are you from? I'm, kind of, I'm really intrigued as to, as to where my audience is from. I'm a Brit. I'm based in the Pacific Northwest of the US in Washington State. Uh, but we seem to have a lot of folks from all around the world. So please let me know where you're from. Uh, so IoT for Beginners, IoT, that's IoT for Beginners. Uh, this is, now this is 
project two. This is, we're working through the second project. So this is working through the digital agriculture section. Uh, if you want to actually catch up on the videos from the last project, to project one, we ran these a while ago. And so the link there, just being dropped in the chat, takes you to the first four lessons with a lesson mm -hmm. and then office hours. So these lessons, in the lesson we went through using Arduino hardware. In the office hours, we repeated it using Raspberry Pi hardware. Um, but the lesson teaches the concepts and office hours answers a load more questions. So there's a whole lot of videos there for you to wade through and use if you're interested. Now, so this is free. It's open source. So you want to use this to learn, go ahead. You want to use this in your classroom. If you're a teacher, go ahead. If you want to take parts of this, chop it up and use it in a different format, go ahead. You know, I know a, a teacher at a university in the UK, for example, is running some of these projects as in a DevOps course to talk about how you build code and distribute code. So you can use this however you like. This is here for you to use to learn. That's why it's MIT licensed, completely free. Um, Adrian Clint's joined us again from London. Hi, Adrian. Ha glad to have you back. Thank you for joining us again. And this is Sam Jamil from Stockholm. Nice shout out to the Scandinavian contingent. Great to have, have my Scandinavian friends back with us. Awesome. Awesome. Cool. Now, one last thing I want to mention is the T in IoT stands for things. And so IoT usually involves hardware. When you're doing IT deployment, you need some kind of hardware to actually use. And our friends at Seed Studios have made it easier to buy the hardware for this. So if you follow that link, just, just be dropped to the chat, it takes you to a page on Seed Studio where you can buy either the Weir Terminal Kit or the Raspberry Pi Kit. And that's all the hardware you need to get going with every section of this course. Now, you don't have to buy hardware. We've actually made it work without hardware. We use a project called Counterfeit. Uh, which was built specifically for this course, which simulates IoT devices. So everything you do with hardware, you can do with Counterfeit. So you can build every single project without having to buy any kind of hardware. You can just use Counterfeit for it. Simulates the hardware. You launch essentially a web page, and this web page simulates um, the hardware, you can say, I want to add this device, this device, and you write code as if you're programming it against the Raspberry Pi kit from Seed, which is an extra line of code to say, use, use counterfeit, and it works. You don't need to buy any hardware. So with that, let's dive into today's lesson. And today we are automating plant watering. So if you joined us last week, we had a soil moisture sensor. So what we did last week is we had our Raspberry Pi, with our Grove base hat. And this is a hat from Seed Studio where we can connect hardware. We connected a soil moisture sensor, this somewhat dirty looking device here. There's an analog sensor. We draw that in the soil and that sends a voltage reading to our Pi and that gets converted from a analog digital converter to a 10 bit number. So if I actually run my code, you'll see we have soil moisture currently at 430. This is a just a number uh, based off the voltage that we're receiving. We talked last week about how you can convert this into actual soil moisture measurements through sensor calibration. So today we want to actually add the feedback cycle to this. You know, we know our soil is too dry, so can we water our plant? And so we're going to look at controlling to powered um, high powered devices from low powered devices. And for that, we're gonna use a relay. So we'll talk about relays and then we're gonna set that up and then we're gonna add some control using of MQTT. And then we're gonna start thinking about timing. There is a whole timing contingent when you have these feedback loops. So we're gonna kind of dive more into these IoT feedback loops. Um, but this is a really good project for anyone who's beginning with IoT because we all love plants. And so having this automated watering, it's kind of one of the canonical early IoT projects. Yeah. The traditional thing is you start with an LED, then you do a temperature sensor, then you do plant watering. And there is a whole world of plant watering kits you can buy from companies like Pimeroni, or you can build it yourself using IoT for beginners. This is kind of a great way to get started. So let's dive right in and let's talk about how we power devices. Now, in the, the previous series of this, we powered an LED and we powered that from our Raspberry, our Raspberry Pi. We actually used the 
5 volt pin on the Raspberry Pi to send power to an LED. And that's fine because we can light an LED with 5 volts. But when it comes to more powerful devices, we can't power those from an IoT device. So for example, I have a pump. Let me show you my pump. Here's my pump. And this pump, I don't know if you can make out, stuff in the way, 12 volts, 5 watts. 12 volt pump, 5 watt pump. Now that is a big power draw. And that pump is designed to pump water around. So it's got quite a big power draw. Now, if I were to connect this to the 5 volt supply of my Raspberry Pi, one, there wouldn't be enough power to actually make the pump do anything. But two, where the pump will try and pull that power, it could burn out my Raspberry Pi. And I don't want that. I don't want to plug in my pump and have it burn the Pi out. That is a bad thing. That means it won't work, and I have to get a new Raspberry Pi, and you can't buy them for love nor money, so it'll cost me, yeah. 200 bucks to get a new Raspberry Pi. And I don't want to do that. So how can we control, how can we use a, a low powered device like an IT device to control a more high powered device? That's what we're gonna be looking at. Um, Janice Q7 says, automate, automate, automate. Yes, automate all the things. We love automation. Yeah, we wanna automate our plant watering. We wanna have that feedback cycle so we don't have to think about it. Love automating. Um, Aguri says, I'm from Bulgaria. Awesome, welcome from Bulgaria. Uh, the first person on these streams we've had from Bulgaria. So welcome. Welcome. Nice. Nice. Cool. So yeah, um, anyone who's just joined, I asked a question earlier, but if you if you came to last week's stream, give me a thumbs up. If you didn't come to last week's stream, can you give me a thumbs down? But also let me know where in the world you're from. Love to know where you are. Uh, last week we had a Scandinavian contingent. We had an Indian contingent and a few folks from North and South America. Uh, so I'd love to know where, where in the world you are. Uh, we get kind of a, quite a, a good range of folks from all around the world. Yeah, nice to meet you too, Gary. It's really cool to have you on, uh, have you on the stream. Awesome. Cool. So thinking about how we control big power from small power, think about a light switch. I use a small amount of mechanical energy to kind of press a light switch, and that turns on 120 volts. I almost said 240 volts because I used to live in the UK. Um, it turns on the 120 volts that goes to the light. I don't physically provide 120 volts to light. I just provide the mechanical energy to turn the switch, and that controls the light. So we could do the same thing with hardware. We could control a switch that uses just that little bit of energy to control a switch that then connects a high-powered circuit to power our pump. And that's how we can use an RT device to control a high-powered device. Um, Husky Nar asks, can the whole project be extended to place the sensor outside the home? Absolutely, absolutely. The only thing you have to consider is the environmental conditions. So if I were to put this, put Raspberry Pi outside in the rain, I'd be in trouble. So I'd need to make sure this is sealed in some, some kind of waterproof device. If I look at my soil moisture sensor, let's clean this off. This one is designed to go in an indoor plant. So we have, we talked about this last week, we have this line here, soil goes up to the line, but above this, you can see we've got chips on here. And so these would corrode if these were outside in the rain. So this, you, you probably wouldn't use this sensor out in the rain, but you can buy ones that are designed for outdoor use. You can actually buy sealed units that are environmentally uh, protect, shielded, protected, whatever, um, so they can last outside. Um, so, so you could do that. Or if you wanted, you can probably just get a case for everything with a soil moisture sensor poke at the bottom and just drop that in the ground and connect that over Wi-Fi. So yes, you totally can use this outside the home. Um, you just need to have environmental protection. Um, in terms of getting the signal off the device, if you're using it in your garden, hopefully your Wi-Fi would reach. If you're using it further, then there's te technologies like LoRaWAN um, to send the signal out. Again, there's lots of soil moisture kits based off LoRaWAN you can buy. And LoRaWAN is a low power, uh, low speed connectivity, but goes over multiple miles, which is pretty cool. So um, yes, there's a lot of kind of things you can do to get this outside the home. Um, you just need to make sure that you are resistant to the environment. Um, great question, a great question. I mean, yes, this is digital agriculture. So Gure says, I'm a software developer, also a farmer. Nice, so a friend of mine actually is a, a farmer and software developer. Um, so he farms in East Washington. And he also, in his spare time, works on Microsoft developing software and does a lot of digital agriculture stuff. So 
yes, there's there's a lot of great hardware for doing this. Um, the, in the developed world, most farms have this kind of automation and monitoring built in for a wide range of things. It's not just soil moisture, it's pollutants, it's temperature. They use drones to, to look at plants. So much cool stuff that happens. Um, and yeah, as Gore says, in a real environment, the upper part of the instrument can, can corrode. So yes, this would corrode. So you can buy... Let's... Does seed, for example, have... If I could... Where are we? Where are we? Um... They've done some... Seed did a whole load that's kind of been sealed. I mean, here you go. It's kind of like a seed studio one. Um, this, this is on DigiKey. But you've got this kind of sealed unit with the probe. So you could buy something like this where this is completely sealed. Um, and you've got the, the grommets all in here to seal the connection in there and that will have the hardware in it. So you kind of buy these, you actually buy kits designed for doing this. Um, so yes, you've got to keep that into consideration. Uh, Mike Guinness says, hello from Boston. Hello on the other coast. Um, there's a road near me called the I-90, which I believe if I get on and drive, it's where I normally go up, up the mountains to go and play in the snow. If I get on that road, I'll probably end up pretty much outside your house. It's kind of bizarre that I live, once I live literally next to a road that takes me to Boston. Um, never been there. Do need to go at some point. And then Hussam Jamil says, is this course only focused on digital farming? So these four episodes are focused on digital agriculture, but they introduce a lot of concepts that do apply across all forms of IoT devices. We just use digital agriculture for this as our kind of examples. Um, the last se the last series uh, that I talked about, this focused on some of the core concepts and you built a nightlight. And then probably the next couple of months, I'll do the next series of this, which will focus on um, logistics, GPS tracking, things like that. So uh, at the moment, yes, these four, although we are focused on digital agriculture, we're learning a lot of concepts about the Internet of Things. So last time we talked about sensors and how sensors connect and the different protocols you can use. Today, it's automation, feedback and timing. And then next week, we're going to look at using Azure IoT Hub, which is a secure cloud IoT service. And the week after that, we're going to look at how we, how we use service code to um, respond to events that we receive from our IoT devices. So although we've, digital agriculture is the hardware we're using, we are focusing on, on kind of a whole range of things. Um, so Dukasoft says, the real question is, how much would it take to automate your coffee production? So interesting internet fact for you. The very first webcam was built to monitor a coffee pot. So students at, I want to say MIT, though I could be wrong, set up the first webcam because they were fed up with walking down like three flights of stairs to a, to a kitchen, to a coffee pot, only to find the pot was empty. So they set up a webcam so they could monitor the coffee pot. And as soon as someone filled it up, they would then go down there and get fresh coffee. So yes, you could do that. Uh, also, Microsoft built a secure IoT platform called Azure Sphere, and that's now in all the Starbucks machines. So, you know, Starbucks, they don't make proper coffee. They have machines to do it all. And they're all managed by Azure Sphere. Um, Keurig, Keurig, if you buy the Keurig pod machines, they are managed by Azure IoT Central. So there is a lot of IoT going on into coffee production. Uh, obviously, digital agriculture side, managing the, the growth, managing the natural coffee plantations. You've got logistics where you track everything through. You've got quality monitoring sensors all the, in kind of every step of the way. Uh, you've got, if you buy a lot of the new expensive coffee machines, they actually provide um, maintenance data to the manufacturer to say when it's gonna, whether it's gonna break or not. So you've got those big commercial coffee machines you get in uh, big coffee shops. They literally monitor, have so many sensors in them to monitor the quality of, the, of what's happening inside, monitor for any manufacturing failures, and they will send that message back to the manufacturer for, for servicing, which is pretty cool. Um, I mean, I would love to be able to press a button and have a cup of coffee be, be made, but making a decent cup of coffee with automation is kind of hard. Maybe I should build a robot that can actually grind the beans, actually fill up the thingy, tamp it down, put it in the coffee machine. That could be an interesting one. Um, but yeah, probably a lot of effort. Maybe, that, maybe that's a series of streams I should do next year. See if I can get my boss to buy me a coffee machine. 
um, and then actually do some streams where I make coffee. Good, good question. Good question. Cool. So we're talking about controlling high powered devices from low powered devices. Um, yes. So Battle Orbit says there is a reason HTTP code 418 IMA teapot does exist. Yes. So that's kind of on the internet Easter eggs. So you, I don't know if you, for those who are not really familiar with web requests, whenever you make an HTTP request, you get back a status code with the result. So if you send a request for a web page, you get back the web page and a status code of usually 200 to say it's done. You may have heard of 404 not found. It's the other famous one. That's a status code to say, I can't find the resource you're looking for. And there is one HTTP code 418, which is I'm a teapot. And that was originally put in as an April Fool's joke, but it is based off the fact that yes, there was this product, this, the idea of a webcam to view a coffee pot. And so you get that result if you request the coffee pot status and you're actually a teapot. Um, I have yet to use that. I should probably, uh, Sam, my counterpart in San Francisco and I, we did a series of streams all focused on tea, um, but we're using it to think about supply chain management and how you could monitor something using an IoT device and use that to control your supply chain. We probably should have actually used HTTP code 418 at some point there. That would have been funny. Um, but yes, so a bit of old internet law, HTTP code 418, I'm a teapot. <laughs> Thank you for reminding me of that battle a bit. Appreciate that. Cool. So the way we control a high pad device from a low pad device is with a thing called a relay. So a relay is an electromechanical switch. So it's like me pressing a light switch, but rather than my hand being moved by essentially chemical energy creating kinetic energy, it does it with a magnet. So you use an electromagnet. When the magnet is charged up, a connection is made, circuit is made, and electricity can flow. When the magnet is not charged, a spring pulls the relay back. So it uses a small amount of power to charge up the magnet, brings the connection in. That connection can then take a large amount of power. When we re re remove the small amount of power, releases that magnet, it turns off the magnet and the arm moves away. And so what we have here, we have our control circuitry. This is the bit that sends the signal to the magnet. The relay is our big switch. And then we have our output circuit. And so our output circuit is only connected when an electrical signal goes to the relay to turn on the magnet. It's got a nice little picture here that kind of shows it. So when we have power, we can send like 3.3 volts in. That power goes around a coil. This coil is around a, metal, around a metal core. When you have electrical signal going through a coil, that induces a magnetic field in a core that goes through the coil. Standard electromagnet, these are kind of used everywhere. And so... Small amount of power turns on the magnet. It moves a mechanical switch, which makes a connection, and that can send a higher power, higher voltage. So with 3.3 volts, we can turn on, you know, as many volts as you like. As long as the as long as the circuit that we're making can carry it, we can send 120 volts, 240 volts, 10,000 volts. This idea works for everything. Small amount of power, turn the switch, voltage. Then we turn the power off. The switch moves back. Could be used power by some kind of spring mechanism. Switch moves back, breaking the connection. That's a standard relay. These are used in absolutely everything. Uh, in your car, if you've got, got a, if you'd have a um, petrol or gasoline powered car, when you start the engine, it needs a lot of power to crank that engine. And again, you have a starter motor which has a solenoid in it, which is basically a relay. What happens? You turn the power on. It sends a man makes a magnetic signal, solenoid moves, makes the connection, and then 100 amps gets cranked through to start the engine up. So this is used absolutely everywhere, this concept. So here's relay hardware here. This is how we have the whole thing set up. You know what? Let's show you the real thing. So this is it here. Got power supply. This is connected to mains power, uh, but it's stepped down to 12 volts because I need 12 volts for my pump. And I've got positive and negative connections here. My ground, negative connection ground, goes to my pump. My 12 volts goes to my relay here. So it goes in the control circuit and then comes out of the, sorry, not the control circuit, the, um, the output, comes out the output to the pump. So the circuit is only formed when the relay is switched on. And then this control circuit is a Grove connector that I can connect to my Raspberry Pi um, my Grove hat. And that turns that on and my pump gets going and water gets sucked through the pipes. 
these pipes. So this is the actual hardware. And this works. You could use this in your home to water, to water a plant. So let's do it. Let's actually connect this relay up, relay up and let's get the whole thing working. We'll kind of see it pumping. And hopefully, hopefully, I won't make a mess. Hopefully, we won't get water everywhere. I'll get the, 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 uh, the pipes in the right place and I won't spill everywhere. If we do, we've got tissues that are ready to clean up the mess. So let's plug it in. Now, in theory, you should turn off your Raspberry Pi before doing this, but I never do because I like to live dangerously. Uh, so the first thing you need to do is I need to plug this in. Now, if you remember, we've talked before, we have digital pins, analog pins. This is digital. So a relay has two states, off and on. So it's connected to a digital connection. And again, it's, when I send a voltage, we're on, turn off the voltage, we're off. So that's my relay plugged in. And then I need to add the code for my relay. Now, all the code is here in IT for Beginners. So I'm going to just copy and paste it from here because you don't want to watch me type code. But essentially, we use similar kind of code to what we had for the soil moisture sensor. Soil moisture sensor used the analog digital converter. We've actually got a Grove Relay class that we're using here. For those who weren't here last week, we're programming this with Python, Seed Studio, who make the hardware. They provide all the Python libraries you need to work with their hardware, which is very cool. Makes it so much easier to get going. Um, so we have our relay in there. And then I'm just going to add in our while loop, just going to add things to relay on and off. And let's just make this a bit quicker. Just to make it. So what we're doing is we're saying we're importing the relay class. We're connecting a relay to pin number five. And if I bring it, look over here, you'll see, let's get close to the camera. You might see this is too many cables to focus. With the now as you can see, this is D5, digital connection. Five. So we catch this number five. Um, and then we turn the relay on, turn the relay off. So if I run this now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the power away from the pump just for a second to illustrate some things. But if I run this and then go back to here, you will see. Then if you can see the light, there's a light here that turns on and off when the relay is on. But also, let's bring the mic a bit closer. Don't know if you can hear that click. If I put it on the desk, it might be a bit louder. If you heard that actual click, that tick tock noise, that is the mechanical switch firing. So that is the magnet pulling the switch, and you actually hear it click. Clicks on, clicks off, which is pretty cool. And now if I just plug in the power. So I've now connected up my pump. You should see all the wires get tangled. So if you if you heard that, that's the pump clicking on and off. And in fact, if I now let's put the output one in first. I think I've got my pipe my pipes run the wrong way. I often get my pipes run, run the wrong, wrong, wrong way with this. Uh, but if I put that in there and that in there, are we pumping? No, nope, we're good. Wrong way around. Always the wrong way around. There we go. So that's just that's now pumping. So that's now starting to suck water. I don't think it's I'll move the camera a little bit. Water's being sucked up to this tube here. And then in a second, pump needs time to prime. The water actually needs time to go through it. because uh, we only pumped for a little bit of time. But in a minute, you should see. Almost, the water's starting to come through on the pipe here. Getting closer, getting closer. So in a minute, that water will start coming through and fill up the glass. Almost there. There we go. You start to see we've got water coming through. Ah! My, my pipe's falling out. <laughs> there we go. So there's water coming through. So that's, that's our pump. So we control this pump. It's taking 12 volts from a uh, power adapter to, get to the mains, but we're powering it just using 3.3 uh, volts from our Raspberry Pi. So that's our relay connected, and that pumps the water through. And so we can then set up 
this idea of depending on the soil moisture, we can then control that pump to get pump going through. Um, Keith Burley says the pump needs to be primed. Yes. So again, I keep saying this, that as an IoT developer, you have, there's a number of folks you need to make, make friends with. You need data scientist, AI engineer, and some kind of domain expert. Somebody who understands what it is you are programming. And so when we use a pump, the pump needs to be what's called prime. So priming a pump is where you start pushing the, something through so that the air is all out, all out of it. Because if I start, if I run, run my pump for like 10 seconds, and that time, that's the time it takes just to get the water from the input pipe into the pump, I get nothing coming out the other side. If I run it for another 10 seconds, I might get hot five seconds worth of water coming through. If I run it for another 10 seconds, I get 10 seconds water coming through. And that's not a consistent amount. So your pump needs to be primed, which means you need to have the whatever the pump is pumping of all the way through all the pipes in the system so that you get a consistent amount coming through when you turn the pipe on. So that's something important. Again, as an IoT engineer, I may not think about that. But if I have somebody on the, uh, on the business side, a domain expert, they will they would let me know about this. So that's why it's important to make friends with people. Um, Guru says, it is okay. Yep, it's cool, isn't it? It's really cool. Such a simple idea. Electric mechanical switch powers my pump. I've got this level of control. My switch is on when I need it. It's very cool. Um, Krill Manel says, Jim, do you have any IoT solutions at home? So I don't have an automated watering solution. Um, just because of the amount of hardware I have to buy to do this, and my house has actually got all that set up anyway. So I just have a timer-based system. Uh, so I've got a literally a timer that plugs into some pipes outside of my house, and that runs water to an automated watering system. So that I have, but I, I don't have much grass here. I actually um, put down artificial turf in my back garden because the way where my back garden is, it's waterlogged. So we never get good grass. Um, but what I do have, my favorite IoT solution, is my lights. And I've got a stream deck under my desk, so I can press buttons. Um, it takes a few seconds the first time. I can press buttons. I can change the color of my lights. So you see what nice little purple glow going on here. And I can have like some rainbow colors maybe, and then other colors. So I can control all the lights behind me. I'm using a, a stream deck under my desk, sends a signal to a Raspberry Pi that controls all the lights, including the Lego lights. I can turn it off, and everything goes dark turn it on, oh, it comes back again. Um, so that's one of the main ones I have. I've also got a light outside my office, which I turn on when I'm live streaming to tell my daughter not to run in and say, hello, um, when I'm in the middle of a live stream. She does that during meetings, which is fine, but live streams, maybe not. Um, so do so stuff like that. Um, I try and avoid too many IoT devices at home because my partner is very much not interested in these technical things. Um, she gets fed up shouting at Alexa's. So, you know, if I, I keep trying to get, you know, Philips Hue lights and things like that, and it's just getting it past the, it has to be appropriate for everybody in the house. So my daughter's got some voice control lights because she loves it. But uh, yeah, with me, um, getting some of that approved is hard, but I've built, I built a few gadgets of fun. I've built, uh, trying to train up a bear detector, um, but I don't have enough bear data to, um, to train that. So, but yeah, I, I, I dabble, I set up something, I play with it, and then I put it away again and get something else out. I'm constantly changing my devices. Um, so Gary says, our pump is primed, then we just pump water. Great, good stuff. Yes, so once it's primed, once the water comes all the way through to the end of the, the output pipe, then you know that when, you, when it's turned on, you'll get a consistent amount of water coming through. And that consistency is important. We'll kind of look at that a bit in, in a minute. Um, so let's actually set up this automated system. So if I change this code here, what I can do is, I might do that, say five seconds. I can set up a, a loop here that simply says, if my soil moisture is greater than 450, so if my reading is high, and last week we looked at the, the voltage value is higher when the soil is drier. So if my number is high, it means I have low soil moisture. And then depending on that, it turns my pump on or off. So if I actually run this, saying we're seeing that 419 it's okay we're dry we don't need the really on 426 we're dry if i just gonna just pull this out a little bit let's just dry this off and now it's saying it's low so turn the turn the pump on so you see i've got water going it's not going into my plant right now it's just kind of going to a glass but because my soil moisture sensor is out 
it thinks that it's not wet enough. If I just stick it back in the soil. So if I just put it back in the soil, there you go. It's now picked up the level and it's turned the pump off. And so that's how you set this thing up to work is you'd have the soil moisture sensor giving that feedback and the pump turns on, soil moisture sensor runs. Once the water's, once the soil is wet enough, it turns off. It's pretty cool. Uh, Krillmanel says, did you say bear detector? Yes. I'm, so I had a bear in my back garden a while ago. I was around the side of my house putting, putting rubbish in the bins, um, heard a noise, looked up, and there was a bear in my apple tree, probably about two meters away from me, which was scary. But being, you know, um, being Generation X, I got my phone out and took a picture before I walked away. Um, and yeah, ends up breaking my apple tree. So I had to dig up my apple tree and throw that away and then smashing my fence. Um, so I've been trying to build a bear detector to try and detect it. And I actually did a stream about this. Let me see if I can dig out the... Um, there we go. I did, a, did do a stream about this. Okay. I'll just drop a link in the, in the, the chat. Um, so let me just drop this link in the chat. So yeah, I was using TinyML, so machine learning that runs on low-powered devices. I was actually running on Jetson Nano, which is not that low-powered. Um, but yeah, so I was trying to build a bear detector. I just don't have enough data of actual bears to train it up properly. Um, you know, it's kind of hard to get photographs of bears in my back garden when I don't know when they're there. I need a bear detector to capture the pictures to train my bear detector. Just a bit of fun. But mainly I get raccoons as well in my back garden. Um, it's family actually, there's a mummy raccoon and three baby raccoons uh, eating some of the fruit from my back garden, which was nice. Um, had a bobcat around here as well. But, uh, so I need to build a kind of a better wildlife detector, but yeah, my bear detector's on hold till I can get more data for it. Cool, so we've got the whole thing set up. Um, we've got it just doing a basic feedback loop. So let's very quickly connect, power this over the internet. So if you think, in the, if you were here for the, the first session, or the, the first project I did, we looked at a nightlight, we actually controlled it over MQTT. The idea we had some kind of internet control, some server running somewhere that could then control the device. So the idea is data would be sent from the sensor with a value, the server will make a decision on what to do and send the signal back. Now, probably overkill for what we've got here with a simple setup, but if you were a farmer, and you had a massive field, and you had an automated watering system that covered the entire field, you wouldn't just have one sensor. Yeah, you have one sensor stuck in the ground, that sensor says your field is really wet, and you don't water, but if your field is maybe sloping downwards, you could have this sensor being really wet, but the other side of the field being really dry. So ideally you wanna have multiple sensors in multiple places, a lot of it depending on the terrain you've got. If your field is dead flat, you know, if you're in like the Netherlands, for example, you're probably gonna be fine. Whereas if you've got any kind of slope, you're gonna have wet and dry patches. Same as if you're close to a water source, you're gonna have water soaking through from the side. So you wanna ideally you wanna have multiple sensors and then something that makes a decision using that data. So you'd have multiple sensors sending data to some kind of service that will make that decision. So we can just do that, use over MQTT, and we can set that up. So again, I'm just gonna take the code from, uh, from IT for Beginners, just to kind of get this, get this going. So we do it, we're using MQTT. We're not using a cloud IT service here. Uh, we're just using a free MQTT broker. It's one at, um, I've forgotten the link is now, but uh, this, the Eclipse Foundation provide a free test over test.mosquito.org. So the Eclipse Foundation provides a free MQTT broker that you can use. MQTT is a lightweight pub sub, pub subscribe message, messaging protocol designed for the internet of things. It's actually invented for IoT data for oil pipes. Um, by someone at IBM. Though there is a joke that it was invented to monitor the Isle of Wight ferry because he actually used this to provide live Twitter updates of the ferries that go between the Isle of Wight and Portsmouth in the UK. Um, Sigari says, I think it must be two separate threads, one for controlling moisture and for other for, for pumping the water. Um, so we're actually going to do it using two distinct services that talk to each other over MQTT. So one controls the relay, one 
measures the soil moisture. Uh, we don't need to measure the soil moisture too often. And we'll talk about this a little bit in a few minutes. Um, but yeah, you want you need to have kind of two separated bits of logic, especially when you have the chance of multiple sensors or multiple uh, watering setups. Yeah, you could have one field with four, four soil moisture sensors and two distinct watering setups. So it's kind of a whole lot of ways, a lot of ways you can set this up. So ideally you want to kind of centralize your logic to bring all the data from the different sensors together, make that decision, and then send the message out to the right places. <laughs> So yeah, you need to have two separate things, but we're gonna do it with two separate applications, essentially. And we're doing it communicating over MQTT. So first thing we're gonna do is actually connect to an MQTT broker. So we use, oh. so we use a thing called Paho MQTT, which is a Python package from Eclipse for connecting to an MQTT broker. So I just pip install it, already got it installed, but that brings in my package for connecting. I can then use that in my Python code. So I can say, I want to bring in the MQTT library. And then I want to actually set up my MQTT client. And we need some kind of unique ID for this because we're connected to a public MQTT broker. So I need some kind of unique ID just to, so that I don't end up getting someone else's data. So I'm going to call this. That's my ID. <laughs> So we cover this in a lot more detail in, where are we get? where are we? Let's do my videos. Maybe I close that tab. Not this one here. Not this one here. Um, there we, go. we could recover more in detail how we do this in in here. Uh, Furious Tiger just checking if you saw my question above. No, I did not. I'm just scrolling through the chat. I am not seeing a question from, from you. Sorry, Furious Tiger. I do not see a question from you in the chat. No, can't see can't see the question. Um please, please re-ask the question. Uh, I don't see it. I don't see it here. Sorry. Um so yeah, please, please re-ask. Um, ah, why, aren't we, why aren't we using cloud IoT service like IoT Hub? Um, so we're just starting off using MQTT because in IoT for Beginners, I want to introduce the fundamental concepts. And so the, there's, there is a concept of I send an IoT service is where I send messages to a service. Now, Azure IoT Hub is the Azure IoT service. That has a number of complexities to it. And so I wanted to introduce the basic concepts just using an MQTT broker. We're not worrying about security because uh, we know the S in IoT stands for security. Um, so we're not worried about security. We just want to get something connected. Next week, we will actually port this to using Azure IoT Hub and kind of dive more into what a cloud IoT service provides. So next week, we look at that. Um, if this is just, I wanted to just introduce the concepts first of we connect to something, we send messages. So that's what we kind of covered off in the last set of videos and in this series. We're just using MQTT just to get the concepts in place. Next week's all about Azure IoT Hub. That's where it gets fun. But there's a lot of complexities to a cloud IoT service. So yeah, great question. Great question. But next week is when we do all that. Cool. Glad that makes sense. Thank you. Um, so we need to collect our MQTT broker. Put a code here to say we connect using test.mosquito.org. So this is a public, free, in, un, unsecured MQTT broker. And we just have this here just so that we can get messages being sent around. You would not do this in the real world. This is not secure. Anyone can read my data. You could literally go to test.mosquito.org and subscribe to Jim Bob Bennett, nightlight underscore client, and you would get my data. And right now, I don't care. This is just illustrate the concept. Next week, we'll secure everything. So once I'm there, so we're connected to it, and then we just start sending telemetry. So we're connected to it here. Let bring some JSON packages in, and then oh, I need my telemetry code. So just going to drop this in here. Get rid of that. Copy and paste is all good fun. So we're going to. Send, oh, I missed my topic. I missed my topic. I missed my topic. There we go. 
what we're doing is we're just sending a, a JSON packet with our soil moisture to the MQTT client. And if I just run this, we're just sending this over MQTT for something to then listen to. So we're not, we're not doing anything fancy. We're just sending a JSON packet over, the, over MQTT. And now we need to kind of listen on the other side to pick that up. So the way I'm going to do that, let's just open up another Visual Studio code. So let's create another Python project. Um, uh, let's just open this up. So I'm just creating another Python project. Python on there. Thumbs up, TXT. Let's create a production environment for this. No, oh, which needs to be reloaded. Oh, there we go. Let's load the version environment. Uh, there you go. Okay, so we've got, we've got a simple basic Python app. Um, so Furious Tiger says, sorry for misses, but we don't have to worry about topics in PubSub. Oh, that's what you're doing now. Um, so I'm not diving too, in, too much into how the MQTT side of things works. Uh, if we go back to the previous videos, uh, these, these ones here kind of sh shares more there. But essentially, MQTT is a PubSub system i publish to a topic and i can subscribe to that topic so all i'm doing here is i'm publishing oh i don't want to call this nightlight client i want to call something else uh soil moisture i'm just literally publishing to a mqtt topic that i'll be listening to on the other side and then so publish soil moisture to soil moisture client um to a soil moisture topic um and then listening on the other side so don't worry too much about the implementation here. Just kind of, just kind of, just trying to illustrate that we can have something sitting here, just listening and responding. So if I just take my code here, there, and I just make sure everything is all set up. Right name, and then I need this is my ID. Um, oh, I need to actually install Paho MQTT, do I? In place for the win. So, you know, nothing too fancy here. I'm just literally... Um, just getting a message and showing it. So if I run this... Sitting there listening. Make sure I run this. So here we're sending telemetry data, and here we're receiving it. So I've got a, a this is I've got server code. This is running locally on my Mac. My client code is running on my Raspberry Pi, and I'm just sending the soil moisture over. Nothing too fancy. But what I need to do now is I need to actually respond to this. I need to actually send a message back to control the relay so what i can do is i can add another topic so, so i've got my telemetry topic which is my data coming from my raspberry pi up to my my server i can add a command topic to send a response back and in my command topic what i can do is depending on my soil moisture level i can send a result and send a command back. So in here, um, so when I receive my payload, it's got the soil moisture value in it. So I can say, uh, if I want it, one is, if my payload soil moisture uh, 
That is, what's it? Greater than 450 is what we said. I can. I love GitHub Copilot. I don't just love GitHub Copilot filling everything, everything in for me. Um, I can say my command can be uh, relay on. I can just do relay, can I? Just do relay true, relay false. That would work. Or do I want multiple ones? Do I want multiple ones? Do I want multiple things? I probably kind of want to actually put down in here. Um, I want, to, yeah, I'll probably send, send, let's send a true or false for the relay state. That's the relay true. Um, in fact, let me just, it's the morning. It's the morning. So if I just recall this. Relay and I can actually have my payload soil moisture is on if we're greater than 450. Greater than 450. There we go. So, what we're saying is when we get a soil moisture reading, if the soil moisture is greater than 450, we send our command back. So, if I run this, let's 410. We send false. If I just take this out of the soil for now, that'll go up and we'll send a different command back. There we go. True. So that's kind of the basic we've got there. Uh, Hassan says, thank you so much. I have to leave for now. Thank you for joining us. Um, this will be this video will be available within a couple of days on the Microsoft Reactor YouTube channel if you want to grab this. So if you want to see the rest of it, cat, catch up the rest of the video. Um, so once we've got our, our logic there, what we need to do is then actually respond to this. And I'm just going to copy and paste some code. What we can have here is on our, so we name this command, inside of Raspberry Pi code, we can respond to a command. So we can have our same command topic, our command topic. And we can say subscribe to the command topic, and when that happens, get the command. And so, if I just restart this, you'll see we've got message received relay false. And then we can say uh, if payload uh, relay relay dot on else. Relay off. So we've got this kind of feedback loop in place. So relay is off because when we're getting a below 450, I now pull this out. That should go above 450. And the relay comes on. If I actually look here, we see we've got everything's wobbling. And we got water coming out. So we've kind of got the whole thing set up. Push that back in the soil, that should switch off. So we've got the whole thing set up now using centralized using a centralized control system. And this is kind of how you build this in the real world. You'll have multiple soil moisture sensors all around your field, gathering data. Some centralized control could then send commands out to control the watering system. Either look control just parts of it, if you've got the ability to water parts of the field, or the whole thing. So you kind of got this feedback loop. But this just leads on to one thing again, you need to think about. The domain expert is your friend here, and this is timing. So we cannot respond instantly. When we're dealing with things like soil moisture, the feedback loop takes a long time. And so if I've got like a, a jar, you know, here's my jar here. If I pour water in there, it'll take a while for that water to soak through. The water might sit at the bottom of the soil and then slowly soak through. It might take a while. And so because it's going to take a while, I don't get that instant feedback. You know, if, um, if I'm on a field, if I've got a massive field, I could cover the whole field of water. And that might take a fair, fair few minutes that water to start soaking through the soil to get to a depth that my soil moisture sensor can detect. And then depending on the soil, that water might soak even further through. So my soil moisture sensor value is going to change. When, it, when the when I start pouring water in, the water's not going to reach the sensor for a certain period of time. So my number is not going to go up. If I, I mean, if I'm pouring water directly on the sensor, it might shoot up. 
if I'm pouring it nowhere near the sensor, it won't go up to the water soak it's actually soaked through. And then once the water is soaked through, it may soak through, the sensor value may go up, and the sensor value may come back down again because the water is soaking away. And so I need to understand my soil. I need to understand how water flows through the soil. Just look at the example here. Yeah, I start pouring. Yeah, by the time the, the water reaches the soil moisture sensor, I could have flooded my plant. If I literally turn the pump and just keep going to the soil moisture sensor reads the value I want, I then turn the pump off, there could be too much water because it hasn't taken time to soak through. So this is why a domain expert needs to be your friend here, because you need somebody who understands the feedback loop that you are monitoring in your IoT device. And so with something like this, what I would do is I would get a soil moisture reading. I would turn on the pump for 10 seconds, for example, just using my pot, using my pot here. Turn on the pump for 10 seconds. Wait for... 30 seconds, read the soil moisture, wait for another 30 seconds, and just kind of build up a graph over time of how the water soaks through the system. How long it takes for the water level to stabilize after I've added water. How, how long from when the pump goes on, when the pump goes off, to the soil moisture number actually stabilizing. And that's an important value to me. So if I know that it takes, for example, one minute for that to stabilize, then I know that when I turn my pump on, turn my pump off, I wait one minute, then I measure again. I do not manage the pump until at least that minute is up, maybe longer. And if I was doing this on a farm, I would need that data. It could be potentially different for different fields, depending on the soil type, the slope of the field, different for different sensors. If I've got a field that slopes, put water on it, it could be that this sense at the bottom goes up faster than the sense at the top. I don't know. I need to kind of cal um, calibrate the different sensors. Like we were talking about last week, with calibrating the value that soil moisture sensor number is reading. I need to calibrate how quickly that value changes depending on the addition of water. And this is kind of applicable for all manner of IoT devices. If you have something that's got a feedback loop, there's no, you don't always get that instant feedback. If you're just using like a, a light, a, a night light type thing, when it's dark, you turn the light on. That's instant, you know, speed of light, that's fine. But if you're doing something like watering where it's got to soak through, if you're adding nutrients to soil, if you're um, I'm trying to think of a few, few good examples, my brain's gone blank. Um, but anything anything where you have this feedback loop that can take time for the feedback to happen, you have to have a domain expert who can explain this to you. You have to have somebody who can tell you how to run this one. And you potentially need to run experiments. Yeah, it's not just about there's one, one fixed value. That value varies. If I work out the value for my jar here, so literally just a small glass jar, if I stick a plant in there, if I work out the value for that, that'll be different to the value for a big pot because it takes time for the water to soak for the soil. That'd be different for value for my little vegetable garden out the front of my house. So you have to constantly monitor the data. And again, Data scientists can be your best friend here. The data scientists can help you gather data, analyze the data, and use that to make decisions on what you want. So that's something you need to think about, and it's got to be it's got to be done on a per setup basis. So if you set, set up your greenhouse, it'll be a different value because you don't want to overwater your plants. Underwater plants, so water is vital for plants. We talked about this last week. The water gives the plant cells its structure. It allows photosynthesis to happen. You know, water plus carbon dioxide equals carbohydrates. And it provides the blood system, essentially, the blood supply to a plant that pumps the nutrients around is water. If you underwater, the plant has no structure. It can't photosynthesize. If you overwater, the plant can't, can't absorb, um, to deal with the oxygen that it needs to, can't get, get rid of the oxygen, and the roots die, the roots rot, and it just dies. You've got to have the right amount. And for that, you've got to better get this timing properly. So this is, again, keep saying it. I cannot say it enough. Data scientists, domain experts, and... Um, yeah, uh, AI engineers, all these kind of folks, these are your friends as an IoT engineer. These are the people who can help you make your code do the right thing. So this is what we talked about. You add water, wait, take the measurement. We add the water, wait for the level, take the measurement. You, and it's always better to add too little. If you add too much water, you can't take it out. If you add too little, you can keep adding more. It's the same as when you're flavoring food. You don't go, yeah, just chuck in all the, all the chili powder. You know, you put a little bit, Cook it for a bit, taste it. A little bit, cook it, taste it. 
Same with water. Napalm684 says hi again, Jim. Hey, Napalm684, glad to have you here. Thank you for joining us again. Um, and with that, hi again is where we wrap up. We're not going to add time into a server because we don't have time. Uh, but I would like to point to AKMS slash IT Beginners Proj 2. This is probably where you registered for this event if you didn't sign up. Yep, Napalm Six at Four. So it's fantastic timing. Yep. Hi and bye. Um, so this is where you can sign up for the next in the series. The link should be in the chat. Uh, but this is what, so next week we are going to be as Furious Tiger was asking. Next week we're going to connect to Azure IoT Hub and actually look at using a proper cloud-based IoT service rather than a free um, free MQTT broker. And we kind of talk about cloud-based IoT services. So that's next week. Um, Napalm says, catch you next time. Yes, you will catch me next week. And so this will be available on, on Microsoft React YouTube channel as a video in the next couple of hours. Um, if you want to, next couple of hours, next, next couple of days, if you want to grab this. But otherwise, thank you very much, everyone. So all of the internet, Jim Bob Bennett, please feel free to get in touch. Uh, thank you all for joining and thank you to our speaker. If you have any feedback, we'd love to hear what you have to say. Please visit, this, visit the survey on the screen or in the chat for this specific event. It's 16971. And if you enjoyed today's session, Jim will be back next week with episode three. I've added the link on the screen as well as in the chat. Thank you, everyone. Until next time. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye.